Our next speaker is <coughs> Marta Vitali, president of the National Research Council, and we will learn everything about the big orientation of Swiss policy in data research data, open research data. Thank you. All right. Okay. So the title of the talk is Open Access, Open Data, Open Science, and what I'm going to try to do is I'll, I'll start with an anecdote because it's sort of uh, symptomatic for what happens. You'll see what it's about. It's very simple. Then I'll talk a little bit about uh, collaboration in science. One of the reasons you want open access, open data is that you want to collaborate, uh, build upon what other scientists have been done. So this is really completely central to the business of science, if I may say so. Okay, and uh, then I'll go a little bit more into this issue of open access and open data, and then I'm going to make a strong point about reproducibility. All of that stuff really is useless if you cannot do reproducible research. So, you know, I can put all my data online, you know, make my paper open access. It might just be garbage if somebody else tries to reproduce the results I'm actually claiming. I think that's a real challenge which goes quite beyond just putting things online free access. And so I'll talk a little bit of uh, what we did in my lab because we have been obsessed with this issue for at least a decade now. And finally, I'll do the institutional stuff. I'll tell you what the Swiss National Science Foundation does, in particular on open access, and that it's actually not so simple. All right, so the anecdote is very simple. I'm sitting at home on a beautiful Sunday. This uh, weekend was fantastic, and I'm doing PowerPoint slides, right, for a meeting. And, uh, but I need, you know, to activate my brain, so I look up some paper which I had heard about. The good news is that here is a paper. It was funded by Swiss taxpayers' money. It's a guy, it's a bunch of guys at uh, ETH on a special program, Systems X, from the National Science Foundation. So far, so good, right? I feel like, ah, we have funded the right stuff, right? Then I want to look at the paper, right? And uh, I'm nicely told that if I pay $32, you know, I'm not sure the paper is actually what I need for what I was thinking about, but you know, 32 bucks later, I might actually find out. Okay. Now, this is a scandal, right? Because we paid for the thing, we paid for the infrastructure, we paid for the salaries, we paid for uh, the research being done here, right here, okay? And in the end, some external player, you know, wants to cash in on this. Now, of course, you know this, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not the first one to, to, you know, to, to show these numbers. Uh, so these are some numbers for a bunch of uh, famous journals, right, which range for, uh, you know, 1,000 bucks to 5,000 bucks a year. This is a journal, I think, that comes out every other month. Uh, that's quite, you know, I hope this is good research, right, because given the price. Now, if you want to invest on the stock market, I suggest Elsevier, Macmillan Group, and so on are actually good investments because inflation has gone up uh, by se less than 70% in the last 15 years. Um, sorry, 25 years, but the journals have gone up 260%. If you look at the most profitable companies in the world, actually you have Apple, and I'm a sucker for Apple too, as you've noticed, uh, and then you have Elsevier, okay? So this is amazing, but I, you, know, you may or may not like Apple, but you know, information technology has actually brought quite a bit of value since 1986 until now. I'm not sure the journals have generated as much additional value for the users during the same period of time. But they surely cashed in quite nicely. Okay, now here is a picture of collaboration. This is a map of Europe, as you may say, but actually it's, the, the, the way the map was done, it's a co-citation or co-authorship of paper, of, on paper. So if two people work together on a paper, let's say between Paris and London, you get the link, right? Beautiful illustration. You can see that you know the, the the enterprise of science is mostly an enterprise of collaboration, and that's why we need to keep the oil in the system that collaboration is as easy as possible. Uh, you also know that you know the master that collaborative research is, of course, uh, the United States. I'm very hopeful that Europe is making great progress, in particular with Horizon 2020, in having more people working together. But as you can see from the map, for some silly reason, Switzerland stays actually outside, right? Uh, it's this island in the, in, in the middle of the continent. Um, at the same time, in Switzerland, the gain in the quality of science 
has been mostly done through international collaborations. This was a study in Nature that uh, if you look at the number of papers that were done only by people working inside Switzerland, hasn't grown very much. Okay? And all the growth of scientific output in Switzerland is linked to international collaborations. That's why this is so critical for us as researchers. Okay, now when you have a very big problem, then there is no question, you have to collaborate. Okay, we have a very nice uh, device, $10 billion device next door, the CERN. Uh, that's certainly a huge collaboration, a collaborative effort. And it's, of course, there that the web was invented because the people had actually to have the IT infrastructure to be able to share data, papers, and so on. But there are other very great, uh, very interesting collaborative uh, problems, citizen science problems. That's a, a project Safecast in Japan, which monitors uh, the radioactive fallout from Fukushima, where people run around with these little Geiger counters and a GPS and put this on an open database, right? Very interesting. <clears throat> Wouldn't be easy to run this in China, by the way. But that's another problem. Okay. Now, when you have a very hard problem, you also have to collaborate, right? Um, so my favorite example is something called Polymath. I don't know how many people are uh, familiar with this. It was launched by a bunch of famous people, Timothy Gowers in particular, who is a Fields Medalist at Cambridge, uh, said, why don't we do theorem proving in math like software uh, developers do open source software? And so, uh, through a blog, they actually uh, put up some conjectures, and then, in particular, the first one was a problem that had been open for 34 years, and it was solved, I think, in six weeks, right? With, by having 35 people sort of around the clock working on the thing, okay? Then, you have problems which are highly interdisciplinary, where you have to collaborate, because otherwise the problem never gets solved. Uh, here are things from life sciences, but using engineering sciences, that's sort of signal processing, to medical imaging, or to spike sorting. Okay, and there again, to collaborate, you need platforms so that you can exchange the questions, the data, and the results. Okay, now what I want to say is that we all often talk about open, open access, of course, and then open uh, data, but it's really part of a bigger enterprise which goes from doing research to generating knowledge and uh, all the way potentially to change the way we do funding. Okay? Um, it is unclear that the way, for example, we run the Swiss National Science Foundation today is the optimal way to distribute money, for example, for high-risk, high-reward research. Okay? Funding agencies tend to be very conservative because you never get fired to give money, more money to somebody who has already produced a lot of stuff, right? You get fired if you give money to some you know, young schmuck who enters the room and you have no, no idea if a result is going to come. However, the biggest innovations, be it in Silicon Valley or in science, often come from you know, the new person entering the room, actually not really knowing the field and by you know, naively trying something actually comes up with the greatest new results. Okay, so this is a whole complex here. I'll come back to it That's in the conclusion. Now, I also want to say that if we don't play open science, we are in a risky situation, which is that we make the cover of The Economist. And when you make the cover of The Economist on something positive, it's great news. <laughs> if it's on something negative, you know, you are under the watch of uh, the society as a whole. So there was a whole set of articles here about something we know, right? Is that irreproducible research is very harmful to the reputation of science. And uh, there, uh, I, I'm going to go through just a couple of examples how to do reproducibility, and I'll start with the simplest one, which is mathematics. So in mathematics, uh, you know, you probably have seen this joke before, you know, there is a proof on the board. I think you should be more explicit here in the step two, right? There is a, you know, then a miracle occurs, right? That's not how you write mathematical papers. You state theorems very clearly, and you publish complete proofs. And everybody can reproduce it with, you know, given uh, enough patience, I would say. But the, mathematics is the biggest, biggest example, also is the oldest example of irreproducible research, which was Fermat's last theorem. You know the story probably where uh, it's about, you know, the, the x to the n plus y to the n is equal to z to the n. Is it possible for n greater than two? And he writes in Euclid's element in the margin, he says, oh, I have a beautiful proof, but I don't have enough space here to write it down. And 300 and Something years later, the conjecture was actually proved. Okay, computational science is still doable. Um, 
you have also theorems, because it's based on methods, which are typically of, of a mathematical kind. You give complete proofs. You describe the algorithms that you're actually using to implement the theorem. And then you publish the code. And you give access to the data. Okay? And, uh, but here already we get into problem because the data could be humongous. Okay? I mean, the people that do meteorological simulation, climate change, and so on, uh, I'm not sure who is going to pay to actually keep all that data. And then somebody says, oh, I want to run it too, right? Uh, so we should, not, you know, we should also be pragmatic that not all fields of science will move at the same speed and reproducibility will have a different meaning. But I think different community will have to be very, very careful to actually achieve reproducibility, to keep actually their reputation alive, okay? Because the domains that have problems, and I'm sorry to hear picked life sciences, but typically that's where the biggest problem comes from because it's much harder to do reproducible research in life sciences. You have to detail the methods, the lab protocol, maybe the code that was used to analyze statistically the data and so on. Uh, but this is very, very hard. And that's where regularly you have, you know, papers published, make a big splash, and you have retractions, which also make a big splash. Okay? But I must say, I don't want to beat on the life sciences, because unfortunately, one of the cleanest sciences, which is astrophysics, is going through some upheaval right now. If you are interested in the background radiation of the cosmos, uh, there is a European experiment called Planck, very beautiful, uh, very reproducible in some sense, because it's a large community sharing uh, the infrastructure and the data. And there is a US experiment called BICEP2, which essentially went along and made a press conference to announce that they had actually found gravitational waves before any uh, peer-reviewed paper was published. And then, you know, six months later, sort of the dust settles. Actually, it was only dust. It wasn't gravitational waves. So this is very, very harmful to science, right? Because now I'm going to look at astrophysics in a different way. Before, I said, oh, it's like math and, you know, pure science is no problem, right? But somewhere, this cancer of competitivity, of also, you know, publicizing results, also com over communicating results, is start to actually have an influence on, all different, uh, on other parts of science. I think it's a big risk. We should be extremely careful. All right. Now, here is just a bunch of things we, we picked up from the literature. Uh, this reproducibility is not implemented. Let's just face it. In medical sciences, that's uh, one that made a splash. 47 out of 53 research papers were not reproducible. Okay. Now, if you talk to the people in this community, it says, well, they didn't try hard enough, right? But maybe it wasn't really described well enough either, okay? Uh, this was actually, in, I think it was in cancer research, and it was uh, people from a drug development companies that wanted to see if you could use published papers to actually develop a drug for cancer treatment. Well, if you're lucky. Um, so bioinformatics, which is closer to computer science and math, same story, uh, you could not reproduce completely what was actually published. So in some sense, it's a waste of money. We actually did a little survey in our corner, which is signal and image processing, and it didn't look very good either. It was 10 years ago. Now I hope it looks a little bit better, but less than 10% had actually the code online, so you could actually reproduce the algorithms that were claiming some marvelous results. Okay, so we have work to do here, and one of the men at the forefront of this is a fellow at uh, Stanford, John Ioannidis. Uh, he published his papers with great titles, like he did a statistical analysis on false positives, and the paper came out with the title, Why Most Research Results Are False. Okay, doing a statistical analysis, you can show that most, in, in certain areas of science, most of the results are actually that are published are actually outliers that have to do with statistical variation, okay? And this is after billions spent, okay? Please mind. Uh, so we had Ioannidis actually visiting at uh, the Swiss National Science Foundation uh, exactly a year ago. We have an annual retreat where we sort of think about the future of, uh, you know, science and funding of science and so on. And uh, Ioannidis was there. He was, he's very controversial, right? Many scientists don't like him because they say, oh, it gives a bad reputation to science. I think he is at the forefront. And if we don't follow or don't read carefully what he says, then we end up like the cover of The Economist. And in the end, we actually lose uh, the confidence of the taxpayer, which would be, of course, a disaster. 
All right. He has launched a center for open science at Stanford, uh, Stanford where many people actually are on this, uh, on this track of doing reproducible research. I think it's really an example to emulate. And you also know that uh, we start to have journals that specifically ask or give the possibility. Okay, they don't specifically ask. They give the possibility to put data online. Um, so a number of journals have good data policies. I'm not sure we are there yet. This is a cultural change in the research community, so it will take time. There is a specific journal by nature. I'm not sure if it's free, right? I'm not sure it's open access, but where you can publish data sets, right? Because one of the problems is that the people that work very hard, you might spend your PhD thesis or your entire research group might spend half a dozen years collecting data, and up to now, you didn't get much credit for the data. So would you just give away uh, your data set and then some other group will actually analyze the data set and get, say, hot publications? And so there also we need to change the way we, we give credit to researchers. And so this is a good trend that, you know, this is scientific data is published by the Nature Publishing Group, so that will be high visibility. And it's a good sign that you can get credit for publications which are essentially data sets. Okay, now it actually, you get bang for the buck. I'll come to you know, uh, how we deal with this in the lab. And the argument is that if you actually do open access and open data and reproducible research, you're going to get more visibility for your research. It's completely obvious, right? I mean, one of the reasons why there is so, you know, quite a bit of, let's say, not so good research being published is because it's not completely transparent, right? You can get almost anything published these days, you just choose you know, a bad enough journal, and it generates a lot of noise. I think it's very detrimental to the whole operation of trying to advance science. Okay, so in my lab, I, I'm you know, trying to motivate people to follow very carefully reproducibility. We are in computational science, if you want. As I said, it's uh, image processing and stuff like this. So we have, we have theorems, we have code, we have data. We put all of this into a repository that we started about uh, 12, 10 years ago, when Patrick van der Waal, who was a PhD student, uh, you know, took this as, as uh, one of the parts he was very interested in. And uh, you can look it up. I think we have a nice, we have the rr.epfl.ch address, okay? So obviously, no, not too many people were interested in reproducible research at the time because the address was free. Um, and what we do is that we, we structure our research into specific projects. Here is some environmental monitoring. Here is something on uh, inverse problems in ultrasound. And uh, below the projects, you have the individual papers with PDF, of course, with code, data, and demo. Now, I have to say that I, you know, maybe I'll go to prison if I say this, but I put all the PDFs online. And I don't care what the publisher has as a policy. I should say this in front of the, la directrice de, de, la, de la librairie, uh, de la bibliothèque. But that's what I do, because I have done the work, uh, or my students, together we did the work. You know, we work also for the publishers. We do the reviewing and so on. I refuse to pay for this. I want the stuff to be accessible. You know, we have written textbooks, three textbooks, they are open access and so on. So this is the philosophy of the lab. But it is true, it's not always trivial to explain to the student that he or she is going to spend another three weeks to transform something which is a bona fide paper we could submit into a reproducible paper, okay? Uh, and, you know, the bang for the buck comes not immediately because the paper, even not being reproducible, will get published. But in five years' time, uh, you know, you like a difference. If the paper was reproducible, it will uh, gather, hopefully, many more citations than if it is not. Okay, so at SNF, we have to worry about this also, and I must say that we are on open data, we are currently thinking about it, we have a working group, we talk to stakeholders and so on. Let me say where we have actually results, it's on open access. So there is a general policy that uh, you have to do either green route or gold route, I must say that I'm somewhat annoyed by the gold route because it's just a way for the publishers to keep printing money by not doing much work, right? Uh, you know, a, a paper, if you pay, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know there are, you know, uh, <laughs> 
people that understand this very well. I mean, you know, the, the publishers are smart people. They have so much money, they can hire you know, any number of consultants to figure out how to survive in a changing business model. I feel the funding agency have been taken for a ride. Okay? Because if all the funding agencies had, had banded together and said, now it is green route, okay, it would have happened. But this did not happen, right? Because the funding agencies, the countries, and so on, are divided. They don't have you know, necessarily the organization to band together and so on. So the publishers just said, oh, you, know, you don't want to, to get the physical journal? Why don't you let the authors pay and the funding agencies pay for it? The only counterexample to this is some marvelous construction by Max Planck and the Wellcome Trust and Howard Hughes, which is called eLife. I, I, I suppose many of you know eLife. It is a real competition to nature and science and so on. It's fully open access, it's very competitive, and it's very high quality. It is life science oriented, so it's not where I could publish, but it's a fantastic example. But of course, the bottom line is that it costs an arm and a leg because they start from zero, they have to build up an editorial staff, you know, they, you know, they have to try to compete with the best by starting from zero. And you know, I saw sort of the numbers, but they are not official. It's very expensive to start a, a competitive journal. But for example, here I would have expected the EU, right? With Horizon 2020, you talk about 70 billion. The EU could have said, we actually launch open access journals that we fund directly, like eLife. And you know what? It would have made a tsunami in the publishing business, right? Because if all the people that are funded by the EU, okay? and not just the people funded by SNF, because we are really, as you saw on the map, it's a very, very small island in the middle of Europe. Um, if, you know, if Europe as a continent would have actually changed the game, um, I think the world would have changed. But this is, very, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, je ne lance pas la pierre, this is difficult to achieve, but I think that's really what the funding agencies in the end have to do. Because the funding agencies pay for the research, they want the research to be disseminated. I do not understand why we would pay for-profit institutions uh, that are just, you know, a cancer onto the system. I'm sorry to be so explicit, but I, I truly think it's like this. And my prediction is that in 20 years it will look different if at some point the funding agencies like Howard Hughes or uh, the Wellcome Trust, or in that case the Max Planck in Europe, in continental Europe, actually takes uh, matters in their own hand. Okay. So, but back to, you know, uh, the formal stuff. So papers have to be published uh, either green or, or gold, and we'll pay for it, and we'll see how expensive it could become, because publishers will get used to it. And if you have a for-profit business model, and, you know, you have to decide if this paper you're going to accept or not accept, but actually, you know, re your revenue goes up by these sort of numbers, it's sort of hard to reject all these papers, right? It's much easier to increase your revenue. Same stuff for books, uh, and that has created quite an uproar. So here are the details since July. We have also a policy, that, uh, a, a policy that monographs have to be published open access within 24 months, and uh, on, on the papers, it's actually in action since last October. Now, let me just give you a final anecdote, okay? So, of course, when I, I showed up at the Fonds National, I said, oh, it's completely obvious we have to do open access, and this and that, and so on. Last week, I had to show up in the Swiss parliament. Okay, it's a very small thing, since Switzerland is very small. Yet, it's a parliament that decides on the budgets of the Fonds National. And in the parliaments, of course, the publishers of monographs and of books had actually taken issue with the fact that we would go open access. And I had to go there and explain why open access was good for science. And if we were spending several billion a year in Switzerland for uh, the, the domain of research and innovation, we would have to make sure the stuff is actually available uh, you know, to the users. I had to explain all of this, right, which to politicians was in part was news, and you know, the publishers were there and saying, no, no, but we have this little business model with you know, publishing monographs from Habilitation and from you know, University of Zurich or whatever, you know, we need to keep this, this uh, little secret garden paid by the Swiss taxpayer. Okay, the result, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but we will try to stick to the open access policy, of course, because this is what we have to do. Okay, so um, to summarize, we have talked about a few of these items here, but it's part of a much bigger picture where the enterprise of science has to be more fluid from 
you know, doing the research, choosing what research we actually do in a more transparent, more competitive way, maybe with use, by using other instruments. Uh, so that will have to change. It's, uh, it's very slow in changing. Then, of course, we need the open data, open access, etc. The reviewing system has to change, because I do not think uh, that the current method can be optimal for finding the best research uh, to be published. And, you know, behind this is how we do research, and that's sort of easier because the researchers are all on board on how to exchange uh, their results, their data, and uh, to make science advance faster. Let me finish with the, the New Yorker cartoon, right? And it's only half a joke, right? So you see the scene, it's New York City, so this is the shrink, it's a patient, and the shrink says, oh, they are crowdsourcing your session, okay? Now, okay, I see it's a New Yorker cartoon. Nobody laughs in, in Europe when you show a New Yorker cartoon. So. But I have lived 10 years in New York, so uh, I feel you know, very close to this. But the point is that it's not as simple as I made it sound before, right? Because, of course, there are many areas of science where you have to be extremely careful how you share the data, right? And yesterday I was in some of the meetings, I spent a lot of time in meetings, as you may guess, on personalized health, right? Patient records and so on. I'm also from computer science, you know, if you say the stuff will be in a database somewhere, someday it will be in the open internet, right? You know, people will promise things and so on, this is not true, right? Uh, I'm sorry, we also have to be very clear here, and so we should be very, very careful how far we go with the open data when it comes to these type of topics, you know, medical records in general, but anything that has to do with <clears throat> humans, but it's not just medical records, right? It's all the stuff about uh, social networks, about the mobility patterns, etc. All the things that are very sexy, very hot, and so on, but in the end, we're going to pay a big price, which is privacy, and I would like us not to ignore uh, this facet either. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very stimulating presentation, and I think there will be some questions. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, As uh, As concerns to the free access to uh, the scientific literature, uh, you are speaking from my heart, and uh, I wonder whether it is so un unrealistic to to grant uh, free access to all to everybody who has once uh, uh, contributed to the advancement of science, being having been a, a member of the Polytechnics, being now possibly a member of the A Cube or uh, the Alumni Association. Is this uh, unrealistic or is this extremely expensive? Let me not be cynical, but if you say, you know, anybody has contributed to science, it might be a very short list. So... <laughs> so it is uh, even... Uh, I might access? not have open access, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I think this is, it's, it's a good question, right? Because in some sense, I mean, if, if the world was Switzerland, it would be very easy to solve, right? Or maybe very complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, depending on how you look at it. I, I think what disturbs me greatly is that, I, I have some slides about this, but I, I, I cut them out in the interest of time, but if you look at the circulation of money around the science enterprise, okay, you have many, many players that try to help each other, you know, the funding agencies, uh, the research institutions, the universities, blah, 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 blah. And then there are some, some vultures, right, in the system. I'm not saying they don't add some value, right? So in my new job, I have also to read Nature and Science every week, uh, which is, you know, the gossip page is very interesting. Uh, so, but, but, you know, their contribution is in no relationship with the cost uh, that it puts on the scientific enterprise, okay? And so there, as a society, one has to decide what is the right trade-off, okay? Now, to say, you know, I'm saying in Switzerland, every Swiss citizen is paying taxes, right? And the taxes go into beautiful buildings like we have here, right? So every Swiss citizen should have free access to, the, to scientific publication because essentially we paid for it, okay? 
And I wouldn't go down like saying if you're a member of our group, because I'm not a member of our group. Uh, <laughs> so, because that becomes a little bit too tricky. So, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the very good presentation. I enjoyed it very much. My question is uh, the following. Um, now you are president of the uh, SNSF, and uh, I would like to know um, what is your position towards the guidelines uh, we saw before about the gold open access. Um, so for the moment, the situation is that the, the funding Swiss so agency um, is saying that uh, before the submission of a project, you should ask for a fund to publish into gold open access. And my question is, how is it possible to know in advance that you will publish in a gold open access? And then, uh, can you uh, tell us if you agree with the amount of money which is accepted by the Swiss funding agency? Uh, maximum uh, rate will be 3,000 Swiss francs. What, what do you have as comment on these guidelines? <laughs> Thanks for the question. So, uh, w when this came up at Fonds National, I said, did you actually do the back of the envelope calculation? How much it's going to cost on the budget of the Swiss National Science Foundation? And we are among friends. They didn't have an answer, right? So, uh, it was clearly a policy decision made out of, you know, this is what has to be done now. The 3,000 francs, I think it was done like this, okay? And which, which, you know, as a quantitative person, I'm a little bit disturbed because what's going to happen is that every publisher is going to look at it and say, oh, we can at least charge 3,000, maybe more, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure this is such a good deal, but we have to start somewhere, okay? Because otherwise, if we start arguing about the price and, you know, and the policy and so on, we would still be in the old days and there would be no open access support. Now, the second one, which is... Um, which is a very good question. It's, it goes along the same line, right? How many papers am I going to publish? I don't know when I uh, submit the proposal, but I think you have sort of an idea, right? I mean, you're, you're, well, maybe your research output goes up by an order of magnitude from you know, one period to the next, and I, I, would, I would like to know how you do it. I mean, mine is sort of predictable, unfortunately. And so you sort of see, you know, a National Science Foundation thing will give so many journal papers and you could set this aside. I'm actually more worried that it will become a substantial part of the funding because the publishing houses will immediately recognize that actually the Golden Road is actually a great way to make a lot of money. Okay? And they will create secondary journals, which will also be very, be very expensive where you, know, you can publish the stuff that was rejected from the primary journals. And when the secondary journals don't like it, there will be tertiary journals, which will also charge maybe not 3,000, but you know, 500 bucks or something. So there will be a whole cottage industry of you know, secondary journals that will live off the golden roads that is being implemented by most funding agencies. So that, I think, is a disaster because it will generate a lot of useless results, papers that you know, should not exist, and it will cost a lot of money to the taxpayer. So I'm very worried about this, but I don't have the answer how bad it's going to be. Why was the green road discarded? So, the, okay, it's an interesting question. There, it's, I must be honest, one of the pressures on the system is life sciences. Because life science is the most expensive part of uh, the scientific enterprise. If you look at NIH, it's a you know, huge operation. Um, and the life sciences are extremely interested in fast turnaround. And the green, for example, in my field, the green road, you know, you have some journals that say you can put it on your website after 12 months, right? And what I do, you know, if you wait 300 years for Terra Fermat's last theorem, you can wait 12 months, no big deal, right? So the turnaround is not as fast, let's say, in engineering sciences that you also know well. But in life sciences, the turnaround is amazingly fast, right? They do the reviewing in a few weeks, then it gets published, gets retracted after a few weeks. It's amazing. So, so you don't want to wait for, sorry, you don't want to wait for 12 months, right? So that's where the pressure came. So people said, oh, it's too long. We'd rather pay 3,000 bucks and get it uh, online immediately. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, you just mentioned that there will be a lot of uh, papers out there uh, that's practically useless. Uh, but I see a disconnect between what you mentioned earlier as well, which has to do with reproducibility. 
if you do happen to have an automated way of you know, checking through these uh, you know, papers, whether they're valid or sound, uh, what, like, why would it matter if there's so many papers that are useless? I mean, it's just that at some point you're leaving it up to the machine to tell you what's you know, worthwhile to read. So I, 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 I share uh, your opinions there. I mean, I, I, you know, people talk about all sorts of, uh, you know, I look at Google Scholar, right? I know the people I, I like to read. I go to Google Scholar, I find what I need, right? Uh, but I think this is not, uh, it's not there yet. I mean, ultimately, I think machine learning will solve the problem of reproducibility. Uh, but it's not here today. And in the meanwhile, we need to have some, some ways to uh, you know, go forward. What, and what disturbs me there is, you know, we are at the other end, right? At Fonds National, you have to evaluate re proposals, get reviews, and so on. And the flood of stuff that is being generated in terms of you know, all sorts of things, which sort of clogs the system, right? I mean, things, you know, the number of researchers doesn't go up exponentially, but certainly the output of research goes up exponentially. Chercher l'erreur, you know, something must be going down, right? And most probably it is actually quality, okay? And, and so, yes, you could, uh, you know, you can say, and, and, but then you also have to, you know, many famous results have been rejected by pri you know, primary journals, right? So you, you have to find the middle uh, road. What disturbs me now is that the pressure on the system is such to produce more, faster, to have longer lists of publications because to apply, to apply to certain jobs, you know, people just count the number of publications. Everything in the system just, and the golden road, just pushes to produce more and more, okay? And this is, cannot be good. And uh, the guard fool, the, the, you know, the, the, the filtering of all this takes a lot of effort, right? And maybe it will be done by Google or some other machine learning giant, but it's not here today. Right now, the system is completely clogged. So in Switzerland, earlier this year, uh, there was a very heated debate um, on the new regulations of the SNF, particularly regarding uh, open access publishing in humanities. Um, at the University of Zurich, we had a small podium earlier, and those professors and researchers are very critical. Even so, just to give you another number, the SNF is willing to pay up to 22,000 francs to have a open access monograph published. And now you mentioned that publishers um, are active in Parliament. So could um, the SNF actually be forced to retract or strongly modify its open access policy? By the way, I really love your open access policy. I'm an open, open access uh, responsible person at the University of Zurich. OK, this is a very good question. I mean, I, I briefly mentioned that I got uh uh, you know, sort of in hot water about this. Um, I don't think we'll have to retract. I mean, we are defending this uh, staunchly because we know this is the right thing to do. I must also so the com say the community is there, so it's, it's mostly the humanities because the social sciences are actually already on board with, you know, sort of uh, this view of the world. And the humanities, which are dear to my heart, right? I mean, that's where I spend my free time, right? Is reading books and philosophy and all this. I think it's, it's that community is also divided. So if you talk to the older generation, they are totally against it because they grew up with monographs and things that were protected and blah, 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 right? So younger generation has a Twitter channel, you know, is open to this and so on. So as much as in the press, we heard a lot of critical voices they were all from the older generation. Okay. So I'm saying there is a cultural change happening there, and time is working for us. Okay. So. <laughs> yes, um, I'd like to have some comments about uh, this green and the gold road supported by um, the uh, European Commission as well. So do you have Mr. Daniel uh, I don't know how it is. Uh, do you have any comments about uh, what has just been discussed? And uh, you do support the Gold Road as well. And uh, what could you add? Well, <clears throat> I think it's pretty much uh, a discussion along the lines uh, we also have in, uh, in the European context. And there are some 
basically, uh, to me, sometimes it feels a bit like a trench warfare. You know, there are some which say, and um, this sometimes the publishers, but not only the publishers, say, well, only the gold route is the good route to do open access, because then you have it immediately. And there are others who say, no, no, only the green route is the good route to do it, because then, you know, you don't uh, put the money in the pockets of the publishers. And so we have these two camps, and they fire at each other with their heavy artillery. Um, but we, on the EU level, we, we decided, for us, the main uh, point that we want to achieve is um, open access. How you do it, we leave this to the individual researchers and their context. Because we also have to have a system that is compatible with the national um, rules and regulations and policies. And we see that some countries are going the green route. We also see that some countries are going the gold route. So in that case, we said, well, from our side, it's important that it's made open access. We stipulate for, for the green route uh, six and 12 months. Um, and for the gold route, as we said, we have, um, we give you the opportunity to have these costs as eligible costs as part of your grant agreement. And then it's up to the individual consortium or the individual scientist, if you have an individual grant, to decide, do I want to spend this money on, on the gold route? And if yes, which journal do I want to go for? Or do I want to, uh, to, to go the green route? So in the end, it goes back to the preference and the, the ecosystem of the researchers and how they want to, to handle that. Perhaps two more questions and then we will start. I have a question uh, related to the uh, SNF funding. And uh, it's related to this part which you mentioned on the beginning that at the moment still SNF is conservative and want to fund only the something what is more secure and uh, stable and don't want to give money to some schmucks which have uh, ideas which can could be uh, highly rewarding but uh, they are uh, highly risky. So is there some chance that there is a little bit change in the policy of SNF or uh, is there a busy? <laughs> okay, you answer me everything. <laughs> no, no, you're right. No, so, so what is we are looking... Is there a chance to have some new call maybe which is going to be in the line with, the, uh, with European research call like future and emerging technologies where you have a chance to try something completely new which could be very rewarding? Okay. Let me give a personal comment. So while the stuff that gets funded is funded by venture capitalists, okay? Okay, if you like it or not, right? I mean, these are the people that will take the biggest bet, right? I mean, because they take a bet where they say one out of 10 ideas will actually pan out. So 90% of the stuff goes into the waste basket. If, I, if we do this at the National Science Foundation, you know, wish me luck with the parliament, right? You know, <laughs> nine out of 10 research projects produce zero. Uh, it will not look good. So it is very clear that by essence, a, funding, a federal funding agency pays by the taxpayer wants to be a little bit more conservative than a bunch of VCs, right? However, there are, you know, there are mixed mechanisms that are very interesting, right? I mean, there are the crowdsourced, uh, crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, for example, which is interesting because you have uh, members of the public that can invest, right? And so, for example, to imagine something where you have co-investment between a funding agency and members of the public on a crowdfunding platform as, a, as an experiment, as a pilot, I think would be very, very interesting. It would also engage the public much more with the enterprise of funding, you know, research that may or may not actually produce results. So that's something we're actually looking at. I cannot promise it will be implemented, okay? That, that I can't say, but it could happen. So. <laughs> Last question. Hi, hello. Um, yeah, yeah, Martin. <laughs> hello. Ah. <laughs> so this is a lot about uh, public uh, open research, but actually it's open publishing. Um, did the SNF already think about encouraging researchers to publish their proposal uh, under uh, open access? Because proposal wrote by uh, Swiss scientists are funded by the public funds. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money, and there is a lot of science inside and a lot of research. But they just stay in the 
computer of the scientists for years, sometimes just sharing the proposal could help other researchers to have ideas and to merge. I know it's utopist, but uh, this is open research. Okay, it, it's a good question. So I'll answer as a researcher. So I'm sorry to say, I live off my ideas. I'm not going to uh, share my ideas while I have not the results. I'm sorry, and most people will be like this. Because if I do this, I mean, I lose my job. I, I won't produce anything, right? Um, you know, the proposals are where you put all, all your creative uh, intelligence at work and you try to invent what might be actually a result five years from now, right? Now, I, I know a lot of people that actually, you know, scrounge on websites for good ideas, okay? And I don't necessarily want to feed these people. I have to make a living after all. And the only thing that I can make a living of is generating new ideas. These I'll keep for myself and for my research group until, of course, I have solved the problems and then I publish them. So sorry to be so... Uh, <laughs> but if you want to put me out of business, you know, you ask me to put all my notebooks and so on online. Then you know, I, I can retire. <laughs> okay, I'm asked to take a very last question. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask if this difference between green and gold road is, is right or if it's right to say that the uh, green road is better because I think if we have new journals which are um, not in the sense of the publishers we have until now, so if we have, if we have real gold, gold road journals, I think that would be the best way. Okay, I'm not sure I caught your question because I, I think, uh, you know, the, I mean, both of these roads have wrong incentives for publishers in terms of maintaining quality. Because, you know, it's, it's I mean, because the incentive for a for profit organization is to increase revenue, if I, you know, if I remember well. And so, uh, so it, it, it lowers, you know, the incentive to do for quality control in both green and, 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 and gold. For me, there is not much difference. I mean, there is this, you know, 12 months or whatever. So it's no big deal, right? Uh, and, you know, the cost that, that you, you may have to pay for one or for the other. But in principle, you know, so, okay, journals should be run by professional societies. They should be run by scientists and they should be run for uh, the community and there should be no wrong incentives. It should all be about, you know, publishing the highest quality stuff in the most efficient way possible. But I, I, I guess I didn't get your question right. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to stress out that we shouldn't have the journals from the publishers who are revenue thinking, but uh, we have to start journals which are run by uh, scientists. And that's what I try to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I, I know about you. Yes, that's a great enterprise. Uh, <laughs> congratulations for what you do there. So, but there also, you know, I, you know, as you, you know, I'm an old cynic, right? So my community is called IEEE, whatever it is, right? This by now, this was started by the community of scientists, and it was all about, you know, generating knowledge and sharing knowledge, blah, blah, blah. By now, they have a huge administrative office in New Jersey, right? Which costs them millions and millions a year, and, you know, they run for-profit conferences to essentially, you know, pay for the bill for their administration. So, you know, it, it's great, you know, in, in theory, everything is great. But in practice, you know, things can go wrong, right? So, for example, IEEE now runs for-profit journals. They run an open access journal that is very expensive, etc. And, you know, I, I'm part of this community. I go to conferences, I argue with people and so on. And they sort of say, ah, yeah, but, you know, we have this cost structure and so on. So, you know, things tend to age, and they don't always age the right way. So I wish you a lot of success with your new endeavor, which is all fresh and, you know, leading to the future. Okay. So this is about, I, I, I'm right, right? It's about uh, um, an open access law journal, right? Yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe you say a couple of words about it, since it's topical. Um, am I still live? Yes. Um, it was in the New Zurich newspaper uh, yesterday, a week ago, so on the 20th of October. It's called suigeneris.ch, and it's an open access journal 
and it's uh, for for legal writers, but it is open to the, the, the aim is to have articles which are also interesting for non-lawyers. For example, paternity leave is a, is a big thing in, in which exists everywhere except Switzerland, and I think the core of that is a, is a legal problem. And it's interesting not only to lawyers, but you can have a scientific law article about that subject. Which is great. Okay, so I think we can conclude with the statement that uh, my publisher is rich and not anymore my tailor, and perhaps I, I will have to change it because uh, the research interest is not always uh, well served. We will have a lunch break now, and I think we will come back. You will go to the workshops um, at quarter past to two because we had some... Two? It must be two. Okay, so it must be two o'clock. So have a nice lunch and thanks again to all our speakers of this morning. Thank you.